Okay, um, nice to see everyone. Um, so welcome to uh, this week's HAI weekly seminar. I'm Jia Jing Wu. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Stanford. I work on computer vision, machine learning, and AI. And this week, I'm very excited uh, to introduce Jeanette Bach. Jeanette is assistant professor of computer science at Stanford uh, and also the director of the Interactive Perception and Robot Learning Lab, uh, IPRL. So her research explores two questions. What are the underlying principles of robust sensor motor coordination in humans and how can we implement them on robots? So research on this topic has uh, necessary to be at the intersection of robotics, machine learning and computer vision. And her lab is especially interested in robot grasping and manipulation. So in today's seminar, uh, Jeanette will share her research on where representations of raw uh, perceptual data enable a robot to better learn and perform robot manipulation skills. So the research explores the question of how to best fuse the information from vision and touch for contact rich manipulation tasks. And Jeanette will also present a fully differential model for sound um, that the rigid body makes during impacts based on physical principles of impact forces, rigid body vibration, and other acoustic effects. So before we begin the presentation, the logistics are, uh, we have enabled the Zoom chat so that you can use that to message the group, but please also use the QR code on the screen, which you know, is showing there right now, to ask questions through Slido, or you can click on the link that will be sent in the chat uh, very soon. And I'll be choosing questions uh, from Slido and maybe the Zoom chat uh, after this presentation. And, but Slido does have a nice upvote feature, upvote feature so that I can choose questions that all of you are interested in. And okay, so closed captioning has also been enabled for the webinar. So you can click on the CC feature on your Zoom screen to show captions uh, throughout the hour. Okay, Jeanette, thank you. And again, for joining us. So feel free to share your screen and we're, we're excited to hear you speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jaju, for the nice introduction. Let me share my screen. All right. So Great. I hope you see the slides okay. Perfect, thank you. So welcome everyone uh, and thank you for inviting me and also thank you to uh, everyone in the audience uh, joining and uh, I hope uh, you find this talk very interesting. Um, so um, I uh, just as a kind of Jajun already mentioned that. So basically my research is really uh, driven by the question of why humans are so incredible at manipulation task. And it's really fairly unclear what the underlying principles of this robustness are, uh, both in execution and actually in learning these skills. And uh, humans have this extraordinary ability to combine our different sensory inputs to reason about the world. Um, and so as someone who studies robotic manipulation, I'm especially interested in how we're able to combine our sense of vision and touch for contact rich tasks such as this one that you see here. So this is the Jenga game. I'm, I'm sure many of you know this game and you know that uh, um, you don't want to topple this uh, tower over and yet uh, uh, still make it larger by removing blocks. And you see that this particular block, this um, person here, this child is touching is probably not the one you should be removing. Uh, but uh, if you've ever played this before, you know that you actually need to touch these blocks in order to feel whether they are loose and uh, actually removable or not. All right. So um, uh, we would really love to uh, um, equip robots with this kind of ability. Um, and our robots uh, also have a physical embodiment, um, which makes them quite special and different from, for example, research that you may do in uh, pure computer vision or natural language processing. Um, and that embodiment uh, can be quite different from that of a human. Um, and so one thing that a robot has is um, it has typically many more sensors than just a camera. A robot also has uh, touch sensors, um, depth sensors, um, microphones, torque sensors, and many more. And uh, there's really this interesting question that I'm that we're exploring in my lab, but and that I'm going to talk today about, like how do we fuse all of these different sensor modalities together, um, and uh, what kind of information do we actually obtain from each sensor that is useful for a particular task? Uh, how are these relevant? Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, two works um, that really specifically look at the sense of touch and how it can be combined with vision. Um, and then uh, at the end, I'm gonna talk about a work that we recently have done uh, coincidentally also with Jajun as a co-author, 
on identification of object material from impact sounds. Okay, so let's get started with this uh, first work, work on learning a multimodal representation from vision and touch. So let's take here an example um, of um, plugging a charger into an outlet. Um, and in order to accomplish this task, we need certain kinds of information. And some of this information can come from um, vision, such as the pose of the plug and the geometry and shape of the hole. Other information can come from touch, uh, like the forces we are applying to the environment or the friction uh, of the plug against uh, the wall. Um, and from this information, we can come up with actions and policies to actually insert this plug. Um, but if we take a different but similar task, like um, opening a lock, for example, we can use the same uh, task relevant information to learn a new policy. Um, in other words, there are certain task relevant information um, that, generalize, uh, that generalizes to new tasks. And the question that we are asking in this particular work is, uh, can we learn a representation that captures these uh, generalizable pieces of information for robot manipulation? Um, we see the value of multimodality actually in many previous works on robotic manipulation um, from estimating object stakes to playing uh, Jenga, for example. However, most of these works do not learn uh, policies directly from high dimensional, high dimensional multimodal inputs. They um, either need handcrafted features such as Jenga block segmentation, for example, or prior knowledge about how to solve a task. And, um, this makes these types of methods uh, kind of task specific. And then there are works that uh, learn state representations of sensory inputs from RGB images and from tactile sensors and show how good representations can improve subsequent policy learning. Um, however, most of uh, the works um, um, that are listed here, they learn the representation from single modalities as it is not obvious how to learn a representation that combine, combines different uh, modalities. So our goal in this particular work is to learn a generalizable uh, representation. And more specifically, we want to take multimodal sensory input um, as denoted here uh, by O and learn a function F that gives us a, a representation uh, that captures uh, task relevant information like the ones I mentioned before. And then we can learn policies pi uh, that takes in the representation a state input and outputs a policy action A that is then executed on the robot. So if our representation is generalizable, we can learn policies for different instances of the, in the same task family, family, hopefully from the same representation. Um, so to study how to learn this multimodal representation, we use the classic uh, PEG insertion task as an experimental setup. And our multimodal inputs are uh, raw RGB images, force readings uh, from a force torque sensor, and end effector position and velocity from uh, robot states. And unlike classical works on tight tolerance PEG insertion that need prior knowledge of PEG geometries, we will be learning policies for different geometries uh, directly from uh, raw RGB images and force talk sensor readings. So more importantly, we want to learn a representation from one pack geometry uh, and see if it generalizes to new unseen uh, geometries. Um, so to learn a generalizable representation, we use a neural network based encoder decoder architecture um, that can learn features from high dimensional sensory inputs um, such as those uh, here. And more specifically, we use different encoder architectures for each modality and fuse the modality specific features into a joint multimodal uh, representation that is shown here by this um, uh, vector in the middle. And the, the, the problem of course is uh, that there's a drawback to using deep neural networks uh, namely that you need a vast amount of labeled data to learn the weights of this network, which for our encoders specifically is a total of half a million parameters. So if we want to learn a representation that can capture task relevant information like poses and friction, it would be very expensive and difficult to manually label our data. Um, so what we found actually is that we don't necessarily uh, 
meet label data, we find that data collected on the robot actually comes freely with task relevant labels. For example, using random, using a random or heuristic controller like the one shown here to run the robot, we can automatically annotate the ground truth optical flow from the kinematics, joint position and geometry of the robot. And we can also collect robot contact data from our force uh, sensor reading as shown here on the bottom uh, plot. Um, and because we will be learning control um, uh, or how to control this robot from this representation, we want the representation to capture some information about the dynamics of the task. So how does an action change uh, the state uh, that the world is in from, from one instance uh, to the next? And so the first source of self-supervision uh, to train this representation is dynamics prediction in the image space. Given the representation of the raw sensory data and robot action, we predict the action conditional optical flow of the robot, which captures the dynamics in the image space. And for our second self-supervised objectives, we again take the representation and robot action and predict if the robot will be in contact in the next time step, which requires the robot to understand something about the forward dynamics and the force in contact space. And our last source of self supervision learns the complementary relationship between modalities through predict predicting uh, temporal concurrency. So, from our representation, our network predicts if our input modalities are timeline. So, let me explain this a little bit more in detail. For example, given paired inputs that all come from the same time step, the network should predict yes, these paired inputs are time aligned. And if you, use, uh, if you use an image of the robot from a different time step that we just randomly sample, now our image, uh, image inputs sorry, are unpaired and the network should predict that our um, sensory inputs are not time aligned. So this objective allows us to encode information of multimodal sensor concurrency and redundancy in our representation. Um, so when we finish learning this representation using these self-supervised objectives that I've just uh, shown you, we freeze the weights of our encoders and take the representations as state input into an off-the-shelf um, uh, deep RL um, algorithm for policy learning. Um, and so because we separate um, learning the representation from learning the policy, uh, our representation can be, uh, so let me go back, uh, can be general to task instances in the same family. And also this, uh, this separation makes policy learning more sample efficient since we only need to learn 15K policy uh, parameters during online training, which is only 3% of the entire uh, encoder network parameters. So the sample efficiency actually allows us to learn uh, on the robot itself. So now we can evaluate uh, how well our representation captures the multimodal state by looking at how efficient the policy learns. So here at episode zero, you see that a robot barely touches the box. Um, and 1.5 hours later, it learns to make at least contact uh, and uh, searches close to the hole. But without perfect alignment, it doesn't learn to uh, insert consistently. Ah, so there's only a 21% success rate. So after only for, for training on a real robot, five hours of training, we can learn a robust policy uh, for insertion. Um, and this is much more sample efficient than an end-to-end -end deep reinforcement learning method, which uh, that also learns the encoder weights, which might, made, uh, which might take days or even weeks to learn a policy from high dimensional inputs. Um, so we show that we can reproduce our results for different pack geometries with the task success rates ranging from 71% to 92%. Um, so if we now take away one modality, our method does suffer. In our simulation experiments where we randomize the box location, we can study how each sensor is actually being used by completely taking away one of the modalities during representation and policy training. So if we only have force data, um, our policy is not able to find the box because it's essentially blind. Um, and with only image data, we get um, 
49% test success rate, but our policy really struggles with aligning the peg with the hole uh, since the camera cannot capture uh, these small precise movements. And with both force and image, um, our task completion rate goes up to 70%, uh, 77% in simulation. Um, so that's much better. And it's not surprising that learning a representation with more modalities improves policy learning. But our results also show uh, that uh, our representation is using actually all the modalities for this contact rich task. Uh, for our last experimental evaluation, we asked if our representation actually generalizes to, new uh, to a new geometry of the pack on a real robot. So we showed earlier uh, that if we learn a representation model for a triangle pack, uh, we train the policy for five hours on a triangle uh, and, and train the policy for five hours on a triangle pack. We can achieve 92% insertion rates when we test on this particular peg. Now let's take an unseen square peg and do policy transfer. We take the same representation and policy from the triangle peg and transfer them directly to this new uh, newly shaped peg during test time. And we see that the success rate really drops by 30%. And this supports what has been shown by many other works in, in PEG insertion that policies do not transfer across PEG geometries. So now uh, the interesting thing is really uh, what happens if we take a representation, if we take the representation that is trained on a triangle PEG and we use that representation as state input for a new policy for a square PEG. So, after five hours of training, we can again reach uh, a 92% success rate on the square peg. So even though policies do not transfer to new geometries, we show that this representation that is multimodal can transfer to new task instances. Um, so not only is it efficient to learn a policy from our multimodal representation, our policy is also robust against disturbances and noise in the sensors. So here are two examples that are just qualitative um, on, a, on a different a new robot. Uh, this is Michelle, the first author of this work, uh, who is basically pushing around the robot and perturbing um, uh, its position. Uh, and yet the, the arm is still able uh, to essentially recover and reinsert. Here's another example with the target movement. Um, so there, there are small offsets that uh, basically um, this robot can basically handle and still uh, insert. Okay, so just to give you, uh, to kind of wrap up this work uh, as an overview, um, we collected self-labeled data through self-supervision, which takes about 90 minutes to collect 100K data points. And we can learn a representation from this data, which takes about 24 hours, but it's done fully offline. And afterwards you can learn new policies from the same representation, which only on this real robot takes five hours. Um, and um, then, um, yeah, I've I already said that actually. Okay, so here are some key takeaways, takeaways from this work. The first is self-supervision, specifically dynamics and temporal concurrency uh, prediction can give us rich uh, objectives to train a representation model from these different modalities. And second, uh, our representation that captures um, this uh, modality concurrency and forward dynamics can generalize. And this suggests that the features from each modality and the relationship between them are useful across different instances of contact rich tasks. And lastly, our experiments show that uh, learning multimodal representations uh, leads to improved policy learning uh, efficiency and robustness. Okay, so this was the first work uh, from this uh, talk. Um, and um, I, I really talked about this approach we use for learning a multimodal representation that can be input to a policy. And to some extent, uh, I have shown how taking away some of these modalities affects uh, learned task performance. But uh, in the next work, uh, I actually want to talk about the case where a sensor modality becomes corrupted during task execution and how the robot can compensate for this and still achieve uh, the desired manipulation task. So this corruption, um, for any one of you who may, may have worked with a real robot knows that anytime anything can break. And so that's what we are, we are looking here. 
Um, so uh, for humans, of course, as we all know, we are pretty amazing. If, uh, even if one modality is noisy or missing, humans are still able to accomplish amazing feats of dexterous manipulation. We can blindfold ourselves and still rely on our senses to help us accomplish tasks. Um, and disability is also known as cross-modal compensation. And the question is, that we're asking in this work is, how can we endow uh, robots with this uh, ability? Um, so here's a, uh, an, an example that I want to give you of a robot trying to fasten some uh, lug nuts on a wheel. And now suddenly imagine the lights uh, are turned off. Um, and the problem is though, the robot doesn't really know that it has no longer access uh, to vision since the RGB cameras are still streaming, although only black. And uh, if we want robots to be able to perform cross-modal compensation, uh, we will need to give it the ability to detect when a sensor modality is actually missing or corrupted. And there has been several recent works in machine learning that can handle missing modalities when doing inference uh, by using deep generative models uh, or training with missing modalities. Um, previous work has explored um, cross-modal uh, prediction of one modality from another, such as predicting vision from touch and vice versa. Um, so while these algorithms can handle missing modalities or do cross-model prediction, they need to know what modality is missing in advance, which, as I just mentioned, uh, with the example where the lights uh, are actually turned off, it's often not the case in robotics. And um, Bayesian frameworks, uh, specifically recursive filtering, have been used in many previous robotics works to fuse multimodal sensory inputs and can take into account sensor noise and uncertainty. However, traditional uh, filters require users to identify and, and define analytical forward and measurement models that may be hard to specify or are actually intractable to compute online. So in this work, we use, again, three uh, sensors, an RGB image sensor, a depth sensor, and a wrist-mounted force talk sensor. Um, and we assume that during training, all the sensor signals are normal. Um, however, during deployment at test time, it's possible that a sensor can break. The cameras might get knocked over or become occluded. The force sensor might break or it starts drifting. Um, and assuming that only one sensor can be corrupted at a time, we introduce an algorithm that we call a cross-modal compensation model, or CCM. And so it, this model, CCM, can compensate for corrupted sensor inputs in three steps. So given our three sensors, this image depth and forest, um, the first step that CCM takes is to detect um, which of the modalities is actually corrupted. So in this example, CCM detects that the image is occluded with this yellow patch there. Um, then uh, CCM rejects and discards the corrupted uh, image input and only uses the non-corrupted sensory data. And lastly, the depth and force data enters the CCM fusion module, which corrects for the rejected image formation process. And I will now uh, go over how CCM is able to correct for these uh, rejected modalities. So it's, uh, again, this, this model is a representation learning model, like similar to the one I just presented to you in the first part of the talk. Um, it takes as input an image depth and forth, as well as this robot state. And our input modalities are fused together in a latent representation, which we will refer to as Z here. So it's very similar to the first work. Now, um, to teach CCM how to correct for rejected inputs during representation training, we randomly drop out sensor inputs. Um, and to generate our missing modality latent representation, Z prime. We introduce a latent distance objective that minimizes the distance between the full modality Z and missing modality Z prime. And this distance objective will allow our representation to learn how to correct for any missing modalities by forcing the representation to shrink the distance between Z and Z prime. We also train CCM using the self-supervised objectives from the first work that I just presented and that we found are important for representations used in manipulation tasks. Uh, lastly, we also train to reconstruct our input modalities, a commonly used training objective for representation learning. And the role of these reconstructed modalities is actually very important here. It's to help us to detect when an input modality is corrupted. So we only train our representation with normal, uncorrupted data. And um, so this model can 
reconstruct. Um, the normal image data was a very low reconstruction error, as you see here. However, if CCM receives a corrupted image input, as the one here with this black square on top of it, uh, during the de deployment, um, there will be a high reconstruction error between the input and the uh, reconstruction, basically, which we threshold to detect when an input modality is uh, corrupted. So after training, we freeze the representation and train an RL policy on it. And we use a pack insertion task again um, to experimentally evaluate how well CCM has performed. Again, during tr uh, policy training, uh, we assume that no input modality is corrupted. And now after policy training, however, uh, now it becomes possible at test time that a sense modality might get corrupted and in this case, the depth sensor and this example is corrupted, it's kind of rotated because someone knocked over the camera or whatever. So CCM can detect the corrupted modality during policy rollout and use the steps of detect, reject, and correct to feed the composited Z prime to the policy. And then still do the pack insertion task. So we showed that during policy rollout, uh, a CCM does not compensate for the corrupted images. Um, the robot mostly fails to accomplish the task. So we only find like a 29% uh, success rate here. If, CC, if we use CCM, this model, to perform cross-modal compensation, uh, the policy can still uh, accomplish the task at 89% uh, of the time, even when the image inputs uh, are corrupted. And so in addition to the corrupted images, we also show that our novel method is able to perform uh, cross-model compensation on corrupted depth and force data with tax success rate of 82% to 78%. And we also compare our method to a variational outer encoder, VIE, with an added latent distance loss, but that does not use the self-supervised objectives from the first work, only reconstruction for representation learning. And it does not perform as well as when we take all of these objectives into account. Um, so what did we learn from this work? Um, essentially, um, we, we showed, uh, I showed you that we can joint, uh, jointly learn um, um, uh, self-supervised and reconstruction, of, uh, or we showed that uh, jointly learning with self-supervised and reconstruction objectives helps with policy learning. And this latent distance loss um, enables cross-model compensation and uh, this model also outperforms all other baselines for learning how to detect, reject, and correct uh, for corrupted inputs at test time. Yeah, so um, in this work, uh, I basically, uh, in both of these uh, works that I've just shown you, um, uh, we used mainly visual sensor or depth sensors uh, that we fuse with uh, force stock sensor information. Um, but more recently, I became really interested in another sensor modality, which is the one of sound. Uh, which, of course, people are um, uh, very good at um, using to do inference, for example, on object material, uh, in this case from impact sound. So to convince you of that, um, I want to start off by illustrating this, um, or uh, by illustrating to you your own mental intuition about impact sounds. Um, and so here's an example um, for inferring materials from vision only. So I, I can tell you uh, these uh, materials of these objects here are, are different. And uh, if I were to ask you uh, what the material of each of these uh, objects is, you would probably have a hard time telling, um, or, or you would probably make some mistakes. So one of the glasses here is in fact plastic, and one of the seemingly steel forks is also plastic. Um, so now I'm going to play this clip, and if you listen carefully, you will hopefully be able to classify the materials of the cups. And if you listen especially carefully, you may even be able to classify the materials of the forks. Okay, so let's play it. Uh, I hope the sound plays well. Okay. So I hope um, you could identify what is what here from the sound. Um, and uh, so if you were successfully able to classify the material of the glass, uh, what you likely just mentally did is something called source separation. 
When the glasses were each struck with a fork, you, you never heard the impact sound of the glass by itself though, but rather heard the combination of the sound of both the glass and the fork, yet you were still able to mentally attend to the sound of the glass to classify it. And perhaps you could even have done it this if there was noise and or a conversation occurring in the background uh, of the recording. Okay, so, um, if, so basically what I want to show you is that humans are really great at mentally extrapolate, uh, extrapolating to infer and reason about sound from very, very little data. And so the question is really, how can we give this ability to robots? And uh, so first off, uh, let's look at some uh, prior work to examine the foundations we can build upon. Um, and um, existing model-based methods for rendering impact sounds specifically fit physically interpretable, pro interpretable parameters, which can be more easily transferred between tasks or used to extrapolate or hallucinate unheard sounds. But these either require controlled recordings, such as striking objects with small pellets, or they are not differentiable and thus can only optimize over a few parameters at once. And then on the other hand, there are, uh, of course, a lot of deep learning based methods, uh, mainly coming from human speech synthesis applications that can learn from data in the wild, but the parameters they learn are often not interpretable. And so more recently in 2020, the Magenta team uh, at Google uh, debuted DS, uh, DDSP, a differentiable audio renderer um, designed for musical instrument sounds. Uh, which they showed could learn interpretable parameters from data in the wild. But these parameters were relevant to music and not as relevant to physical properties of rigid objects um, uh, as evident from impact sounds. So uh, the model that we um, proposed or developed uh, is called diff impact, and it brings the advantages of differentiable uh, rendering to impact sounds. Uh, using the techniques of model-based methods to achieve sample efficiency and physically interpretable and transferable parameters, uh, yet being fully differentiable, so it learns from data in the wild, uh, like deep learning-based models, and really bridges um, these two worlds. So uh, you may wonder, like, why do we care about physics-based models with interpretable parameters? And um, the thing is that if we can extract physically interpretable parameters about objects, tools, contacts, environment, and so on, we can easily reuse these parameters to extrapolate and simulate new impact sounds using new combination of parameters of contact conditions, objects, and uh, environments. So to see how we can extract these physically interpretable parameters from uncontrolled recordings, let's consider, consider a little bit the physics of impact vibration. It turns out that an impact sound can be broken down into two main components. Uh, the extrinsic contact forces acting on an object or the impact force profile shown here and the intrinsic acoustic model of an object um, that is its uh, impulse response. And the convolution of these two components is the most fundamental aspect of an impact sound. Um, other components such as uh, background noise, noise and reverberations are also big contributors. So impact sounds, uh, this impact uh, our model, models these other components as well. Uh, but for the sake of this presentation, uh, I'll mainly focus on the forces and the impulse response. So if we can decompose an impact sound into each of these components, we can infer important properties of objects and how they were contacted. Then as I showed earlier, we could even specifically swap out the impact or object parameters to simulate a new sound in a new acoustic environment. Um, so by decomposing uh, an impact sound into these constituent com contributions is an ill-posed problem since we are essentially trying to solve a deconvolution. So the key idea of this work is um, um, behind diff impact is that we can bias the decomposition of impact sounds by using physics-based models to both provide a helpful model bias and extract physically interpretable uh, parameters. Um, so let's start by focusing on how we parameterize the impact force profile with a physics-based model, just super briefly. Um, the first thing you should know about impact forces is that they are generally not ideal impulses, so they have different sharpness to them, uh, depending on the velocity, shapes, and hardness of the colliding objects. So we use a Hirsch and Hausstein model of contact forces, uh, shown here, which can be parameterized with the timing of the impact, uh, the scale, 
uh, or magnitude and the time constant uh, tau, uh, which represents the sharpness of the impact. And we use a Gaussian approximation of this model, which has the same parameters, but has some smooth derivatives, which is always good to have. So we model an impact force as a linear combination of M impact events, each parameterized by these three parameters that I just showed you, and uh, to create a time se sequence of multiple impact events. And so next, I explain the physical model behind the object impulse response. So rigid object vibrations are well modeled by modal vibration models based on a spring damper model of a network of particles within the object. Um, as shown here, each object has multiple modes of vibration uh, occurring simultaneously uh, with each modes, mode vibrating with a different frequency, initial gain and damping. So an object's impulse response can be expressed as a sum of exponentially decaying sinusoids. Um, and diff impact models this by assuming the impulse response of an object as a finite impulse response with a linear combination of n modes. Uh, and this has like three parameters, which you know is maybe not so important for you to know, uh, having a frequency, a damping, and an initial gain. Um, so the important thing to know is um, that uh, roughly that there are these two components that we're trying to infer from a final sound waveform. Um, so now I've explained to you the physical models we use for the impact force profiles and the object impulse response, which we convolve together to get an impact sound waveform. So the main thing that's left to explain here is the loss we are optimizing against. So for our last loss, we compute um, uh, magnitude and log magnitude spectrograms of the original ground truth audio, and then compute the same for the audio synthesized uh, by our model and then take the L1 difference between the two. And that's essentially the loss that we're trying to minimize. Uh, so now let's see how this plays out uh, on an example of a studio recording of striking a ceramic mark multiple times. Here's the original recording. Um, so to model and extract parameters from this real recording, we start by initializing a random series of uh, impact forces and a random impulse response, which are convolved to uh, get our running estimate of the synthesized waveform. And we take the spectrogram of this, and then we compute the L1 loss against the ground truth spectrogram to adjust the parameters of the upstream models during gradient descent, descent optimization. Um, and uh, so here we have, so this is how this basically looks like and converges. And uh, you see that it converges quite nicely and that we get the impact forces and the impulse response. Uh, so the extrinsic and the intrinsic uh, parameters. Um, so the, the full model is a little more complex uh, than this. Uh, so feel free to read the paper of this as well. This is how it sounds pretty close to the original. And for now, um, uh, just to explain a little bit, uh, there's uh, some modeling of the background now so, and of the room response also part of the model if you want to look at this, uh, at these details. Okay, so now let's look at how well this actually works, um, not just qualitatively, uh, like I just showed you, but also quantitatively. And so we evaluate our model in three different applications. First, showing that we can learn from controlled recordings in the studio, um, just like existing model-based methods. And we next show a passive learning a use case where diff impact can outperform existing deep learning methods to enable a robot to learn acoustic models of objects passively from data in the wild, uh, like these ASMR uh, YouTube videos that we found. And finally, we show an interactive uh, learning example where uh, diff impact can equip a robot to learn separated acoustic models from impact sound recording collected in a noisy robotics lab. Okay, so first I show some examples from the experiments on the controlled recordings. And we wanted to show that diff impact can match real impact sounds and uh, that because of its physics-based model bias, it can infer physically meaningful quantities about the impact. And we took recordings of hitting everyday objects with an impact hammer uh, to record both uh, audio and ground truth uh, impact forces on the object. 
and uh, diff impact then fits a model impulse response for each object and makes an estimate of the impact force profile over time using only this ground truth audio as supervision. So here um, uh, we show how well our model can render the sounds made by the ceramic mug. Um, and so our model was able to infer relative impact forces that closely approximate ground truth using only audio as supervision. Uh, so here's the ground truth. And here's the um, sound generated by diff impact. And uh, our, so that was pretty close. Um, but yeah, this was a very controlled experiment. So our next experiment is, uh, shows how diff impact can enable a robot to passively learn acoustic models from in the wild impact sounds data with many imperfect impacts through an end-to-end -end learning task. So we first curated a data set of audio from ASMR videos, which where the creator is finger tapping uh, different everyday uh, objects. And then we used diff impact as a rendering layer in an auto encoder for impact sounds. And uh, our model and all baselines were given the ground truth uh, magnitude uh, spectro, um, ground truth magnitude only spectrogram as input. And then we're trained to produce the sound from the spectrogram using ground truth audio as supervision. Uh, and we compare our autoencoder based um, uh, on diff impact to other autoencoding baselines, uh, baselines, which were designed for musical instruments or human speech data. Um, so here's some examples um, uh, where we talk about this. So again, here's ground truth. And um, uh, here's again, the bass lines made for musical instruments. This is more for speech synthesis. Sounds a little bit more close and this is ours. Um, yeah, so uh, basically we did a human user study as well, um, which uh, where we asked users to uh, actually decide which, uh, which sound is more realistic uh, using a forced choice. And um, we, we, we found um, that um, the participants of the user, user study um, um, actually find diff impact to produce more realistic redubbing uh, of this video um, compared to the alternatives that I just played to you. And so for our final experiment, we showed how a robot can use diff impact to learn acoustic models of objects interactively by striking them together in a noisy robotic uh, lab. To collect impact sounds of objects, the robot strikes different household objects with different household tools like you see here. And maybe you remember um, our thought experiments with the wine glasses and the forks at the beginning. Um, when the tool and the object strike uh, each other, the resulting sound is actually a composition of both the sounds made by the tool and the sound made by the object. Um, but uh, I show you that the robot can use diff impact to separate the sounds of these uh, objects from each impact sounds uh, it hears, and then use the separated sounds to better classify materials and infer properties about them, just like you did with the thought experiments at the, or hearing experiment at the beginning. Okay, so here again are some results from separating the sound from a steel fork striking a ceramic mac. Um, the fork and the mug make actually a very similar sound, but diff impact is still able to capture their differences with the higher frequencies of the fork's response being more resonant than those of the mug. So here's a video. And now in the microphone's recording, note that there's still some motor noise from the robot. And in order to separate the sound sources, our model composes its sound by fitting acoustic models for both objects and the background noise, combining them to produce the final sound. So we can turn off the background noise to generate uh, the denoised version here. And then we can turn off the mugs, the mugs contribution and isolate the fork contribution to get only the estimated fork sound. And the same for the mug sound. And so uh, along the way of synthesizing the sounds of impact, diff impact has fit an acoustic model for each of these objects. So here we play the synthetic separated impact sounds from each object. 
uh, to demonstrate the quality of the acoustic uh, models diff impact has derived. So here's the ceramic map, the polycarbonate cup, the steel bowl, and the wood holder. So it's pretty distinct, I would say. Um, so we can also, again, fit acoustic models uh, for each of these tools um, that the robot used to strike these objects. Um, so here are examples separated, uh, for a separated impact sounds from each of the tools. Um, and so these are not uh, as good as the ones before because the tools are typically less loud. Um, so let's start with the ceramic chopstick, the polycarbonate spoon, the steel fork, and the wood spoon. Okay, so um, yeah, so at the beginning of this presentation, you mentally separated impact sounds to classify materials of the wine glasses. And similarly, our model uh, can also separate sources of these pairwise impact sounds until we see what this means for manipulation robots. So we first constructed a classifier uh, to classify material from sound and trained it using a publicly available purely synthetic data set of sounds. And here's the classification accuracy we get from trying to classify materials from the original audio that is not, um, yeah, it's not separated. Here's the accuracy from separated object and tool sounds from each object with our model-free source separation baseline. And finally, here we have the accuracy from using sound separated by diff impact. So uh, diff impact similarly outperforms our baseline for being used to regress Young's modulus from separated sound. And estimating such properties, um, uh, sorry, before, um, and, uh, before manipulating an object can inform the robot how, about how it can safely and effectively uh, be manipulated. Okay, so I want to summarize um, at the end of this the key takeaways. Um, so this impact uses models to extract physically interpretable uh, parameters, which can be used for simulation and extrapolation. It's differentiable, so it can learn from recordings in the wild, and it can solve many um, dual forward and backward problems with just one framework. And um, we can use these results for important downstream tasks in robotics, such as material classification and stiffness estimation. So that's uh, kind of the end of my talk, um, uh, where I showed you how uh, different modalities uh, can be uh, can inform a, a robot uh, to do to be better at manipulation. And specifically, we used uh, visual data as well as touch data and sound data, and. Uh, yeah, so just uh, maybe to wrap up as some, uh, with some conclusions, uh, for manipulation robots, the touch and auditory sense are extremely useful, especially in combination with vision. Um, and how to fuse modalities effectively is still an area of active inquiry with many open questions. Um, and one of the questions I personally have is what is better a learned or manu manually designed interpretable state representation and how can we scale to many different tasks? So with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I also want to thank, of course, my groups and my amazing students who you see here and my funding sources. Great, thank you, Jeanette. I think there, thanks for the great presentation. I think there are actually quite some questions. So I can go through them uh, based on the popularities. Okay. <laughs> So for example, uh, there's one question now, uh, what makes a self-supervision objective useful for the pack insertion task? And uh, is there obligations on uh, the presented objective? Have you tried other objectives? And could you share some objectives that you tried but are not as successful? Yeah, um, definitely. So first of all, the self-supervised objectives um, are useful because you don't need labeled training data, right? So that's, first of all, why self-supervision is useful, right? It saves you a lot of work. Um, and uh, let me see if I actually have some, I don't have, uh, I don't have the results on, let me see, maybe this one. Um, oh yeah, here. So um, we actually did compare to other losses uh, and the most important one or most well-known one is an unsupervised loss, not self-supervised, unsupervised, where you just reconstruct the output. 
And uh, so here we show again the success rate of the policy um, that is using uh, a representation learned with only reconstruction. Um, and you see that it's really low. Uh, it's just 36% really um, uh, in compared to 78% where we use our action conditional uh, losses. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what we found. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's another question about uh, the tasks you discuss are still um, quite specific, you know, packing insertion. So how far do you think we are from robot that can really generalize this? You know, the person mentioned things like disaster recovery, but that's kind of really far away. But, you know, in some sense, I was like, maybe the question should be, uh, yeah, how far do you feel, you know, how much do you feel we can extrapolate? And what are the tasks that you think we can really realistically generalize to? And what are the big barriers that we need to overcome? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree uh, in a way. Uh, um, solving pack insertion uh, is not the, maybe the most exciting like <laughs> problem in manipulation. There are many more interesting problems like um, manipulating articulated objects or inserting different plugs or assembling objects. Um, but, uh, and so, um, one thing I think that we can take away from the study where we evaluated on peg insertion is that if we are within a certain set of tasks where there is some variation within this task, then we can learn representations offline and then learn the policy much more cheaply uh, online, essentially, right? So, um, so that is one thing that I personally take away from this, that um, um, these learned representation can generalize within a certain uh, class of tasks. So for example, if we were to do an assembly task, let's say, um, then uh, I would hope that we can use uh, one representation um, to uh, be generalizable to um, variations within that task class as well. Uh, but yeah, I think overall, um, there's still, it still takes a lot of time, right? Like it's five hours is still honestly kind of unacceptable <laughs> to uh, on a view of robot, right? To learn a new task. Uh, but there's some interesting new work, right? That is on multitask learning, on meta learning, uh, where um, people try to really uh, work on how can we not learn from scratch, but instead learn something from the learning process of that other task uh, to be faster at learning the new task as well. Um, but one thing to, uh, I want to say again, uh, another thing to take away here is that um, the more modalities you use, the more um, information you have in that state to make the robot successful at a task. Uh, and so I think that also helps at being more successful at learning tasks because you just have more information. Touch is especially useful for manipulation tasks. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so yeah, you, you just talked about all those, the, the ways we can potentially in terms of methodology, how we can generalize to new tasks. And, um, but there's also another question about, so among all these possible tasks, which one specific task, what specific tasks are most excited for you? you know, oh, you excited about? wow. I'm, I'm pretty much excited about uh, all the tasks. <laughs> Maybe not peg insertion because we've done this a lot, a lot now, but I mean, really so many tasks are are really unsolved for a robot that is confronted with raw sensory data, right? Like uh, if you maybe have, if the robot is equipped with models about the objects it's manipulating like mesh models and it's a very controlled environment, I think we can probably do much more. But as soon as, as we throw a robot into a home, um, it's, it's really hard. So anything from just opening all the cupboards in the kitchen, all the drawers in the kitchen, to um, manipulating deformable objects from uh, just fabrics or dough, um, or unpacking a grocery bag, packing a grocery bag on the other hand, or packing things together. These are all extremely hard tasks. Assembling that IKEA furniture piece that you brought home, right? For example, all of these tasks are extremely hard and unsolved. Um, and so honestly, I'm kind of excited about all of them. <laughs> so, yeah. And, but mostly it's about, I think I'm, I'm excited about finding the underlying principles that hold for, um, or that provide the foundation of really enabling a robot to do all of these tasks. And so we have to think about the representations, what modalities to use, um, and then how that can feed into policies and maybe also high level plans as well. Cool. 
Yeah, I think there are also a few like more technical questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, there's a uh, Calvin uh, who was asking, I think this is actually for the sound, the, the, the diff impact work. That is, is it also important uh, for the model to also consider uh, the location and direction of the forces? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think uh, in, this, in this work, we haven't considered this at all. Um, it wasn't important to infer the material in this case, right? And to do the separation. Um, but I think if you were to do this more fluently, let's say you had a robot that doesn't have this sequential process of first like, um, you know, hitting an object and then manipulating it, but it would actually hit it and in, in, in the next uh, time, like already using that contact it made to maybe do a grasp, then I think it, it be, there it really becomes important, like how you apply forces in what direction. Um, from the material, for example, you could infer something about um, the friction coefficient of this object. Glass is more slippery than, for example, anything that has felt um, uh, or something like that. And so um, if you want to prevent slippage uh, and you have a glass, you really want to make sure you're very precise with the directional force you want to apply. But for, you know, so it's kind of like an, um, more like an implicit relationship here from coming from the material that you get from the sound to then inform how precise you have to be with the uh, application of the force direction. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question from uh, Hiroki Nishimura. Um, the question is, um, so for the cross-model compensation work, you know, have you considered quantifying the uncertainty in the latent space to account for the missing or conflicting sensory information instead of just minimizing the L2 error? Uh, because he said, uh, or she, sorry, they said, I guess the uncertainty information would be useful for downstream policy learning. Yeah, that's a very good point. We haven't considered it in this work, but I do think it's a, it's, it would be a very interesting question on how to do that. But yeah, we haven't looked at this uh, for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, Really okay. open question, great idea, I think, to look into this. Okay, um, there's another question from Shamal uh, Chandra about, uh, that's actually maybe very far from what you do, but I guess you, you tried innovation uh, tactile and uh, you know, auditory information and putting them together. And the question is about, have you tried using like other modality like sonar, radar, or lidar. So I guess maybe you did a little bit of lidar sensors and depth sensors for autonomous driving, but the question is how are you using these different sensors uh, to reduce the error, increase the accuracy and robustness of the policy? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So I, we haven't used um, lidar in this manipulation work because typically in robotic manipulation, you have access to uh, dense depth sensors that work in indoor settings, while in autonomous driving, right, you typically use lidars that uh, work outside um, and or stereo cameras or stuff like this right and so we I did do some work on in that space on using uh, RGB data and lidar data is very sparse uh, and how to fuse that um, and so I mean clearly doing that fusion fusion uh, definitely helped I right now by heart I don't remember what the uh, you know, how much more we were gaining, for example, on the new scenes data set. But certainly it's an interesting question how to do that in um, autonomous driving as well. Um, I mean, yeah, for sure it, it, it helps with, um, uh, in this particular work, we actually did multi-object tracking. Um, and so doing instance association across frames was much helped by RGB data as compared to more sparse depth data, for example. So again, it's like a complementary relationship there. Hmm. Yeah, I guess we have time for one final question, which I'm going to go through the Zoom questions. And I think they're actually having a number of shared questions about what do you feel as the immediate applications of the technology and do you have plans to commercialize it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I personally don't have plans to commercialize it, but yeah, you know, <laughs> if anyone wants to, uh, wants to please uh, come forward. But um, I mean, really, I think, um, uh, there are uh, any of this technology on fusing this kind of sensory data should be helpful in these industrial manipulation tasks, right? There are so many startups, for example, that 
um, are currently out there doing pick and place task uh, packaging, uh, picking up from conveyor belts and stuff like this, right? So if they were able to, to use all the different modalities, it should be helpful. And it would be super interesting to see how this work that obviously comes out of an academic lab actually scales up to real world settings. Um, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I think we're at 11. So yeah, I guess all, that's all the time we have. And thank you again, Jeanette, for joining us and for the great presentation, for answering all the questions. And thank you, audience, for your thoughtful questions. Um, so next week, there's not going to be an HAS seminar because we're going to have this HAS Spring Conference. Um, so you can find more information on the HAS website. Thank, Thank you, Jatun.